I'm not sure if you can hear me, but you can start um, if you're ready I, now. Hang on one second, Travis, you're just walking in. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, good evening, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to everyone um, that's here for tonight's caucus meeting. First, agenda item spring important dates. Um, lots of activities happening over the next six, seven weeks. So I just like to highlight uh, some of those activities. Um, coming up on April 15th, we do have a half day um, of school for students and um, teacher professional development. And then beginning on April 18th is when uh, April 18th, we have elementary band and chorus concert, and then we switch into May. And in May, May 2nd, we have our FFA banquet. Uh, May 4th is the prom. And moving on to our concerts, May 7th, we have our high school spring choral concert. And the 9th is our middle school uh, choral concert. And the 13th is our band concert. Uh, the following few days, on the 15th, we have our Athletic Awards, followed by the 16th, our Academic Awards. On May 21st, we have our High School Steel Band Concert. And then May 28th, I know I previously had talked about um, our staff recognition being on May 23rd, and the VFW was double booked uh, for that night, so we had to switch the date to May 28th. Um, it's also the, the same day as our fourth grade picnic and the last day of school, which is a true half day, is May 29th. And graduation is also on May 29th. So a lot coming up. Take a look at the district calendar. Um, this is also my board report so that folks can take a look at those dates um, and make note of those. Moving on, our uh, next Buildings and Grounds meeting is scheduled for April 23rd. It's one of those that if we have agenda items for the Buildings and Grounds, we will um, have that meeting. If not, then we will move to cancel uh, the meeting. Okay, moving on to the agenda itself. Personnel. Uh, A1, A through F, we have um, some retirements, some uh, resignations um, between all positions, professional and support staff. Uh, number two is a recommendation um, for a K-12 school counselor um, in the district. And three are recommending uh, some employment for uh, elementary food service, middle school food service, and other elementary food service. And so Mr. Peart is... Does that complete all of our openings for food service? Yes, it does. Great, thank you. And then uh, item four, sorry. It's a long list of our, our summer program help. We have our directors and teachers, uh, nurses and aides. And so this summer we'll once again be operating our literacy camp STEAM camp, kindergarten camp, um, and we also are offering the uh, cursive camp yet again, but I don't see, did we already approve? We don't have somebody for the cursive camp yet. But again, number of pos uh, positions here for our summer programs. 
Uh, along with that, we do, uh, previous month, we did um, approve some directors and we had to modify uh, their contracts based on the number of days. And so this brings them in line with what uh, should have been approved to operate and be the directors of those summer programs. And number six is the recommendation for a volunteer uh, soccer coach. So other agenda items. Uh, first one is letter B is ACTI, Adams County Technical Institute operating budget. And so the interesting uh, thing, our participation is still uh, really high, but our tuition was actually reduced $14,013. And that's because of the formula to calculate tuition. It's a, a three-year average um, of the number of students that we have in the program, along with the percent of students that we have in our high school in comparison to across the county. So we take the number of students we have, whatever percent that is for the um, across the county for total enrollment at the high school, uh, it's factored into a formula to uh, come up with what our actual tuition is. And for us, even though our participation is this basically up, our tuition went down because of that, that formula. Okay. Uh, letter C is uh, where it's that time of the year, our graduating class. So we have a, a list of all of our students that as of now would be uh, earning their, their diploma and graduation um, coming up in May. Letter D is the official um, approval of having graduation. And so if you take a look here, one of the, the um, things that we discussed when we made this school calendar 18 months ago was to give us an opportunity to have the makeup days, uh, multiple makeup days and to have days during the week and not just the weekend. So if you see here, graduation is scheduled for Wednesday, May 29th at 7 p.m. and the uh, event of inclement weather We'll push it to Thursday. And if we have bad weather there, we'll push it to Friday. And so it gives us three opportunities to have um, graduation. Letter E is disposal of some obsolete uh, equipment. F and G are revised policies and new policies, policies that we'll talk about later in the agenda. And letter H is um, the creation of a new activity account for Quiz Bowl Club. Um, they've completed a fundraiser and Quiz Bowl is quite active. And so this allows them to uh, put their money into account to be used for Quiz Bowl. Okay. So now we move on to finances. Mr. Peer. Uh, $1,100,000, and other expenditures of $2,345,131.62, leaving any balance of $10,232,482.46. Looking over the um, revenue for this month, very standard, is there any specific questions about the revenue? Please let me know. And then moving on to the expenditures. Again, uh, very standard, our higher dollar amounts are our uh, cyber charter, as well as our utilities and contracted services. If you have any specific questions on any of the expenditures, please let me know. Uh, moving on to the cafeteria fund, we have a beginning balance of negative $85,165.26. We had revenue for the month of $103,506.58. We had a transfer from the general fund of $23,000. We had payroll expenditures of $57,337.71 and other expenditures of $81,625. Leaving the net balance of negative ninety-seven thousand six hundred twenty-one 
$1,000.39. Factoring in the federal and state reimbursement, uh, we're at $1,315.78. Looking at the revenue, um, very standard for this time of year. If you have any specific questions, please let me know. And then again, uh, to the expenditures, very standard uh, food service invoices. If you have any specific questions, please let me know. Okay, uh, moving on to the capital reserve fund. We have the beginning balance of $518,320.72. We have an interest revenue of $517.06. And all expenditures, $3,448.13, leaving an ending balance of $515,389.54. Looking at the expenditures, these are the final expenditures. Um, it's definitely the final expenditures for WL buyers. That's the last piece of the electrical contract. And then I'm not 100% sure if it's a final crab tree, but it should be very close. We don't have to back. All for the lock in project. And then, last but not least, is the scholarship fund. We had a beginning balance of $19,975.54. Interest revenue of $1.69, leaving an ending balance of $19,977.24. Okay, thank you, Mr. Peart. Uh, consent agenda items. If we go back, we can um, include the minutes, our fund reports, uh, personnel A1 through uh, A through F, two, three, four are a no, uh, five is a no, six can go to consent. Letter B, um, Cannot go to consent. The graduating class can go to consent. Graduation ceremony can go to consent, along with obsolete equipment. Uh, policies revised and new. What, what um, they could go to consent to be separate. Are you looking for guidance on this, Shane? Uh, yes. Sorry, Dan is is yes. Yeah, we can vote on them. Okay. And Dan's suggesting that we'll vote on them so that we'll we'll keep those out. Um, and then letter H, the quiz bowl club can go to consent. All right. So that takes us to uh yes. Yep. Yes. We, we certainly can. I did follow up with Mr. Chubbs. Um, and so I, I don't know if he had shared anything else, but I did after last meeting follow up with him. So sorry, we said, go ahead. I didn't, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Question was about uh, number six personnel. Uh, yep. No, it should be, it should be um, going to consent. Yeah, thank you. Thank no. you, Dan. <clears throat> so next, um, we have a couple presentations. So I will stop sharing and uh, turn it over to Mr. Korb, who is our Director of Innovation and is also Webmaster. And so for many, many, many months, um, oh, uh, let me look. Just made you a co-host, so you should be able to share the screen now. So Mr. Korb has uh, spent many months on the website, so he's here tonight to share some background information 
and to give you all uh, some information about our new website. Mr. Corp. So uh, what we ended up doing was being a little bit more uh, preemptive. So the timeline, I think we went through the slides to give uh, more context to come here. Uh, but ultimately, we wanted to get a jump on advantage because it is a good um, They ended up migrating most of those files over. This is where I'm sort of in the process. Over 1,800 pages are migrated over. And then I come through every single one. Uh, and we map and restructure, uh, but make a little bit more user friendly for uh, the viewer of the website, no matter who they are, uh, up in the district or in the district. I uh, want to make it accessible and transparent for the people who want to access the website, and they can get the valuable information if they want. So here's just a brief walkthrough. Late this week, the site will be live, and we'll be sending out information about that to uh, not only you, but also the staff, and also the community, and how they can access it, and what it looks like. So during the week, this week, we'll be transferring over to the domain name servers and all that fun stuff that goes on in the background. Um, but we're really excited to, to, to uh, really do the case. And that was ultimately one of the biggest uh, pieces is you want to modernize it, but also make it uh, really accessible and allow all of the content that it needs to be shared out accessible to everybody who has access to the site later in the winter. Um, so you can see a couple screenshots here uh, across the main page. Um, we also have another screen that popped up. <laughs> Uh, again, more uh, more navigation that provides simply the access to the music site. And also, I spent a lot of time in crafting alongside the principals um, and working alongside some of the secretaries uh, to update the site to uh, give each home page of each school a, a brand new look, uh, which really captures a lot of student learning that's going on in the building. So we want to celebrate the success of the students bring each and every day, and we want that to be at the forefront. Every time we access the local school page, I want to see something new. I see something exciting in the following month inside my school district. Uh, the brand new site like that one in the same file. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have a new node level directory, so you can find the people that you're looking for rather quickly. Um, and you can find their contact information quickly. And on top of that, I did get a request a couple times from my uh, different parents that were asking for um my calendar. Uh, which is by cal, which means that you can sync the district calendars with your phone. Um, so you can sync your Google calendar, your Apple calendar um, to the events that are going on in the college door. So each one of those has its own calendars. You can also access the athletic calendar through there as well. You want to sync certain events uh, to your schedule so you can uh, come to those events and support our students. Um, in addition to that, because 95% uh, of our users are using the web, they're using the website via the phone rather than a, a different device, so on, on a tablet or like our students are accessing via their iPads, uh, it is mobile uh, responsive. So anytime you access on your phone, it's going to be a lot easier to navigate from there. Um, and so some screenshots are there, and some will look like these ways. On top of that, we used to have, or we do still have, teacher pages that are linked to all of the speakers that are across the district. So in order to make it a little bit more accessible and using them on their side of things, and I just sent out an email today, um, I'm going to find some teachers that every single teacher is going to be uh, shared a Google slide that has the generic contact information, but it's linked directly to those contact cards on the website. So if they, if you go on and you click on your, your child's teacher, you're going to get all the contact information. And then if the teacher decides to add more to that, and create a set of virtual classroom on there, uh, all the information is there for them to be able to do that. So they can provide as much of the information there, but one extra layer to get in contact with your uh, child's teacher. These are updated live, and because they're Google Slides, it's right in the draft. So it's no longer logging into the website. Um, they can do uh, a lot more with it. 
Um, launch we go. So the launch is coming this week. Uh, we're going to continue uh, to train staff on the work with building secretaries and some other individuals who, who should have access to the site uh, from the development side. And they'll be able to update at announcements, at district news, at our building level news. So they'll be continuing to be trained over the next week. Um, there is also a new website trailer that I'll be sharing out with the community, the families. So we'll email those out to all the parents, all the students, all the staff. Um, just something in the building to view about the website, the uh, the reasoning behind it, and ultimately what they can look forward to for their experience on the site. So new website trailers will be coming out this week as well. So we'll do that notification when the website goes to launch the Yeah, that's the one button again. So we're almost done. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is the future plans of the website. Ultimately, we want to make sure that we continue to update this and promote our students' success with inside and outside the building. Um, so there is a, going to be a schedule that's going to, that's going to be rolling where we have video and photo highlights, events that are happening on campus, sports teams that are, that are uh, competing across campus. Uh, I've been gathering video and photo across the district the entire year, and we have thousands and thousands of really cool things that are happening, and we want to lay it where we're going to get the share out of the community. Uh, increased promotion of teaching and learning at the Reading School District. Um, we're going to talk about building a district level news and how that's going to be a regular occurrence on, on the website. And the updated website content is going to be ongoing. There's some processes in place now that are going to make sure that it's up to date when it goes out and ready to go. So ultimately, um, that is the website launch, the nutshell. So we've been working since uh, June of this past year, going through every single page, and looking forward to this launch um, uh, to a, a great innovation and great content for the community of what we're doing. So thank you. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Corb? I have a quick one, Shane. I had yep. a hard time hearing. When did uh, Josh say the launch date is? I'm sorry. End of the week. End of the week. Yeah, so Thursday is our second launch. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. All right. Next um, topic is we have uh, for the first time in the in the district presenting uh, Ms. Brooke Schaefer, our director of special education, who has been working with Mr. Peart and myself on uh, just understanding background of our special education consortium uh, that we're in with the Upper Adams School District and Fairfield. And so she's been gathering lots of information, looking at our needs, and tonight um, has some information for the board to consider. Ms. Schaefer. Um, it's been a great start to the, to the, my school year here, we've been um, learning a lot, learning a lot about the state and all the different um, resources that we have for special needs resources for our students. So I've been really trying to get in classes, getting in placements, just trying to get an overview of what our special education department looks like here at Bermuding, and just seeing how we can expand, how we can just make it better for our students. So we're servicing all of our students and their needs. So we are in consortium with um, Fairfield and Upper Adams, and we are we are part of that consortium. So Fairfield have the classes that are in the uh, autism support. They have the continual education for grade. The um, Upper Adams has good school support and that gets paid. Grade two, uh, sorry, it's K through 12th grade. Um, and then the median has been most And we are currently, we have classes in fifth grade to 12th grade. So, what we're looking at is really trying to look, we need that additional, we need to complete the continuum to that we need to spend. So, that's why I'm here tonight. We are taking a look at that. So just taking a look at what we have to key in, what we need for our students for next year. We, we do have one student coming from earlier that mentioned that would possibly need a emergency support placement. Um, emergency support classroom is students that do have some behavioral needs um, that are, you know, that cannot be met in a regular classroom. So we want to look at really 
you know, hanging on their behavior, making sure that like, they are structured and just in the classroom, making sure we're able to get those students ready to go back into that regular classroom. <laughs> Uh, we do currently have three students that are placed outside because we have not had the, the amount of students necessary to open the classroom correctly. Um, we do have two, three students that are currently placed in our classrooms. So um, we, we do have those students that we can look at them with that. We also have these two students from the other schools that they have students that they could ask them. And then we do have um, students that do have some needs currently in our elementary goals that some behavior needs that we currently are, are looking at evaluating and looking at, you know, maybe a lot of them can in the classroom. However, they still continue to work with our students. So that is that's happening right now. We, you know, we're at the point where do we consider out our placements? Do we how can we maintain them here in our classroom in our buildings? Is this the right place to school them? So now that we don't have that opportunity here at the school, so we're really looking at it. So that gives us a total of 69 students that we would have for that upcoming school year for Option to continue to stay that as well. And we have the students in early intervention who most likely be placed um, in River Walk or in the classroom. We would have the students that are currently placed to remain in their current placements. And then we have the three or four students that are currently taking a look at. We would most likely uh, place them as well. Um, just recently, we did have a student that uh, we just recently put them to place the students uh, this week because of last week. Um, the River Rock is an IV, the IV is actually released in place, and there are two to three students on the side of the students. So that is a student process. So that's something that we want to do in consideration. Second option would be to create the emotional support class at the meeting. Uh, that would be completing our continuum, which it makes sense. Uh, you know, for applicants that can see continuum, character has a complete continuum, and there's a we would have that student we have the able to take the early intervention. We would be able to have the three students that are out placement. We could have them return to the district so that we can give them a cost benefit to us. And then we have the three or four students that we're currently looking at placement. We could so we can have them wait here for a little to be placed with them. We also have the assistance to some students that they could be used. And with this, we would hire one teacher and then two classroom aides to keep with that classroom. I just have, right, I just have one quick question. Sure. You said that the LIU has increased up to 75,000 per student. What were they before the increase? They were just with this. Currently 68,000. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it does. It does depend on how much services that they're getting. Um, if they're in our building, we do have that ability to have them in uh, other places as well. We need the regular things as well, but it might not be as much. But if they're out place, it's fully out place, and they can't get out place spot. So there's not much room to, you know, save money for the next. So we can have like every year we may have um, the district currently looking at placing the third curriculum courses of current primary school students. And that cost would be from about two hundred and twenty five thousand to three hundred thousand. That would be for next year, that would be for all the school year. Like I said, we have just currently recently placed a student, so we have a student that you know just did a lot of fun and went through that hot, so looking at next year, we will have that student place in the current school. And then the current school district you know, has three like, students placed, but that does not include the one we just placed last year. So without this classroom, the district would be paying up to five students, approximately 300,000 to 325,000 in tuition. 
So does everybody understand what this slide is saying? So without the budgeted position that we're basically shipping, okay, would be two hundred and fifty thousand. I'm sorry. Yeah, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars would be the cost. We currently have a budgeted position that is going to be absorbed by this position. So you're not adding a professional position to the budget. Okay. It's shifting where it currently is to this new uh, classroom if you tell us to move forward with this process. I want it to be clear, no matter what choice you make, it is an increase to the current budget that we're going to approve for 24-25. Does everybody understand? It's just how can we fiscally be more responsible one way or the other? And as you see what we are going to get to in the next slide, yes. Clearly, creating the new emotional support classroom is a more fiscally responsible way. Now, that's one aspect of what we need to consider when we're considering this. You know, talking with Mr. Shaker and our team, we believe that we can meet the needs of the students that we place them in the classroom just as good, if not better, than outside place plus on their tier of school. Okay. Um, plus the bonus of it, it's less money added to the budget than if we sent them out to an IU classroom or we sent them to River Rock or any other place. Does everybody understand? So no matter how you look at it, it is an increase in the budget. Okay. What we're trying to do is minimize how big of an increase that is. And what this slide here shows you is the great thing. So without opening the classroom, the cost would be $377,043. Okay. Uh, the benefit, as you can see, if you work through this, I don't call it a savings because, like I said, it's an increase to the budget. So the benefit is the $277,043 for next school year. Okay, um, so not only are we gaining um, from opening our own classroom and not sending these to the outside placements, we're also receiving the tuition from Fairfield and Upper Adams for the students that they sent to us. And Fairfield is committed up to two, and Upper Adams is still unsure if they're able to send one district. So we took the smaller of that, um, which is the $40,000. The tuition rate, which is agreed upon by the consortium, is twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so that's per student. So that's how this comes to be the number that. Just want to make sure everyone understands how this all flows and works works out. Anybody have any questions on the financial side with what you see and what's been presented? I'll also add this doesn't um, factor in transportation. Um, and so when you do this outside placements, we are responsible to transport students there. Um, and so depending upon where they live and the routes, like this doesn't take any any of that into consideration. 
It also, I mean, we will have to transport those students. Sometimes it's special transportation. Sometimes it is a regular bus. So there'll be a cost. But the reality is transporting to all of those outside placements is much more expensive than here uh, to our school. Out a quick question. Where is the where is the teacher position being reallocated from? So we are currently uh, going through the process of staffing, uh, analyzing the, the budget positions. So we currently have five uh, teaching positions that are being evaluated as to need for next school year. We definitely know that we have one in the elementary school. That is what this position is going to be taking. Um, there are two other ones that are still being evaluated and that will be in the May meeting. I will have all that detail for the board when they approve the preliminary budget. But that's where the, this one's coming directly from the elementary school. And that's based on class size. A couple of the positions folks aren't here. They've been on leave. Um, and so we don't have anybody in those positions now, but Justin, because of situations, you always budget for that. And through our analysis of class size, we feel very comfortable that we wouldn't need to fill one of those. And we're looking at the others and we still have phenomenal class sizes. So similar to last year when we came before you to ask uh, about the autistic support, we did a very similar presentation. Um, and what we were seeking is approval to uh, move forward to post the position because obviously it's contingent upon getting good staff. And that was one of the key pieces last year for autistic support. And that's no different for emotional support. So while on paper, this looks great, you have to have the right staff to be able to open up that classroom. And this is the time of the year uh, this is the perfect time of year that we start to post positions for next school year. And so what we're seeking is to um, post a position uh, to see the type of candidates that we get and with the hope of um, get some quality candidates that we can open up this program and keep keep our students here. Is everybody OK with us at least posting to see what that looks like? And we'll keep you apprised of next steps. The good thing is what Ms. Shaper didn't share with you. She has an extensive background in emotional support, former teacher, trainer. This is one of her areas of expertise. I think we all kind of need some time to process and think about it before we get any kind of green light to, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks, but it, yeah, there's a lot of information, a lot of numbers to kind of make a decision on the fly, whether or not to go or not to go. I understand how it would help the district, but it just, want to take a deeper look at things before you give an official green light, at, at least in my opinion. I don't know what the rest of the board thinks. So I'll, I'll just add, and that's why I'll give, that's why I emphasize the fact, no matter what, 
the budget is going to be spent. And I've said this numerous times throughout all my budget presentations. Remember, Special Ed is one of those areas that if we do not meet the needs of students, we are in deep trouble. We're going to spend 10 times the amount, if not higher, than what we're talking about here. So what we're doing is we have a need that exists in our district, but can also benefit the consortium as a whole. Up to this point, we have had the enrollment of our own students to be able to sustain and open the classroom. Okay. Now we do. Plus, we can add additional students from the consortium to Fairfield and Upper Avenue. And that's income. That's income. Okay. So the bottom line is we either spend less money by opening our own classroom or we spend a lot more by sending them outside placements. So that's, I just want everyone to understand that because either way, we have to meet the needs of these students, whether we do it in house, which we feel is very beneficial, and we can provide an excellent service and education to these students, or we send them out. We have to do it either way. So that's why you had to decide whether you're going to give the green light or not. So this is what I'd say because what you're going to see from the budget presentation this month is not included because I wanted to make sure that either had the yay or nay, but next month you need to approve the preliminary budget. If I don't have that green light, I'm not sure how that's going to work. I don't know whether to put it in. Well, I have to put it in either the higher number or the lower. It's going in, so the, the budget is increased um, based on this. It's just how, how much it's increased. Do you need to have certain conversations with the students that will come back? I know I'll be starting. Dan, can you you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, I can sort of hear you. That's why I'm sort of typing while I'm doing this. Um, so is it are, are we looking for, are you looking for is administration looking for guidance? Is that what they're looking for right now as far as like a direction to go? Yes. And so right now, again, the, the commitment is to nothing. We just would need to post the position. So we're seeking the ability to post the positions to see what applicants we get. And then okay. if we can get applicants, then we would come to you to seek permission to hire them. Um, that's okay. what we're, that's what we're seeking. And just to kind of make the connect, this is the same same process that we went through last year when we were considering uh, opening up the autistic support classroom. We try to use the same framework, same information, uh, same process. Um, and this is this is the first time. Um, and I will tell you, I hear directly from Upper Adams and Fairfield relentlessly because we don't have an elementary program. And that's part of the consortium. And so they really give me, when are you going to open it up? And I tell you, for years, I've said, when we have the demand and we can sustain it, that's when we will. Why would we? I'm not going to recommend doing it if we are going to lose money. And this is the first mm -hmm. time uh, we've had the consortium for over a decade. This is the first time that we actually have. And we see we see even more coming in the pipeline that we think that we can meet the needs of our kids and it can be sustained. And we can also generate some revenue from other students coming in. So um, we are the only district in the consortium that doesn't have the continuum complete. But it's because we haven't had the demand, but it's definitely, definitely there now. Okay. And Justin was explaining the financial aspect, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. I just want to make sure I was hearing everything. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I personally, of course, I can't see everybody there and who's talking and everything, but I think it's okay to move forward as far as uh, posting to see what's out there. Um, I couldn't really hear Jen's concern completely. I think it was Jen or maybe it was Mary. Um, somebody said something, but um, I don't see an issue at this point if we're just out there looking to see 
um, what's available. Just more of a clarification type, type thing. Then. And if there's any additional information you want that we didn't provide, we certainly can can do that. We tried to be as detailed as possible. And, and actually, since uh, Ms. Schaefer put this presentation together, we had an, another student kind of pop up needing services. And that's that's the world of special education. Building up another slot for another incoming or intervention student that we don't want to swap to them because our first classroom is school, we would have to add this. So it's not only really a motion of support, it's also a lot of students' classrooms too. So if we're able to do some shifting, that would facilitate the classroom support as well because the other position is school already as well. I also failed to mention we have space. We don't have to displace anybody. We have open classrooms, so we can pull the program in and not displace any classroom. We have the open classroom at the elementary. And actually it has a restroom in the in the classroom too, I believe. Yeah, so we talk about if we were able to just move around and that would definitely I think it's a good idea to try working in the United States of the right group. And I agree too, because anytime we can keep them in house, I know from experience of having uh, special need foster kids um, who had to get up at the, you know 5 a.m. to ride a, a minivan all over the locations to pick up all the, and because they had to go all over the place. So, yeah. I'm, Understand the importance if we can keep it. As well, we can have students come in and then we'll turn up for just a little bit of money just to get some of those some of those skills and those that counseling aspects in the classroom. So we could utilize the program more than just those students in classrooms. So I really feel like it's the benefit of those students. We'll be meeting kids' needs and saving money. That's a win win. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody good? Yep. Great, thank you for all your work and you. we'll work on getting that posted and uh, free plug anybody out there listening, we will be seeking an emotional support teacher and even more importantly, two um, aids for the classroom which are really instrumental in supporting not only the teacher but kids. Thank you. So Mr. Corb, you'll just have to stop sharing so that Mr. Peart can share. Next topic is preliminary budget. So we have our April update. Okay. Um, so, to begin with, um, there's an interesting carryover from the discussion we just had. So, IU services, um, the estimate changes that have happened since so March, the fall in March, there was actually a decrease in the IU services. Um, they provide us with updates throughout the year, and towards the end of the year, we get more updates regularly. Um, but based on the needs that we've had in the two weeks place, uh, we now have an increase in the IU services. $22,221. Um, that's not significant, uh, but obviously it doesn't play into the overall numbers and information that you need to have as you make your decision as we get towards the preliminary budget and the final budget in June. Um, so this is the only estimate change for this month. And then actual budget changes um, that affected the 24 25 uh, budget. So, um, and this is since March. So for professional staff, um, this was a decrease of one hundred eight thousand five hundred six dollars. And this is no, this is not an elimination of any position. As I stated earlier in the previous presentation, we are still analyzing um, four positions that are currently uh, in the budget uh, to see. As a team, if we feel we still need them, 
um, and that decision will be part of my May budget update. Um, so there could be adjustments with that. Uh, so stay tuned on that. But what this is, is for any adjustments for individuals who have either resigned or retired, uh, most of those individuals um, were at a higher dollar amount on the teacher salary. So what I have always done traditionally and it worked out well, uh, I reduced that budget to a master step by um, budget position. Um, the majority of the time it comes under that. So I'm usually good on budget because we were hiring younger teachers, which are less experienced. Sometimes it goes the other way, but in the net, we're always ahead. I've always been ahead in all the budgets we've done. So that's where these adjustments have come from. Okay, there's no elimination of any positions uh, in here. Okay, uh, the support staff, same thing. We have quite a few that are retiring. Um, and again, there's no elimination of any position. It's just a reduction in the budget um, compared to the higher dollar amount that the current retiree was made. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Um, as we stated earlier uh, last month, the medical insurance uh, was approved at 15%, but with our benefit changes, we had an uh, increase in our deductibles that actually brought it down from a 15% increase to a 14.4% increase, just based on the change in the deductible. So that decrease, as you can see there, is the $23,164. Okay. Um, the next one, the high school bus building budget. So I know uh, there's questions uh, posed related to four specific topics uh, related to the high school budget last month. Um, and working with the high school administration, um, it was determined that at this point, the esports. Uh, can come out of this year's budget. It's something that will resurface in the future, uh, but for this year, be comfortable pulling that out. And the MacBook cart, um, we are able to find uh, an additional um, solution that no longer do we need to have the MacBook cart in this year's budget. So both of those items have been removed so if you recall, the eSports was 20,000 and the MacBook cart was 22,000. Um, the other two, before I go on, that's the, that's the 42,000, those two items, okay? Um, so they then pulled out of this 24, 25 budget. The other two items that were related to the stage and then the sound system, that is still being analyzed um, and I will have updates for that in May for those two items. But at this point, those two items are still in the budget. Uh, but that's, like I said, we could see some adjustments related there as well. But right now, that currently is still in the budget. Um, and then ACTI tuition, like Dr. Hodge just mentioned earlier, um, there is a decrease. Um, pretty substantial dollar amount because I had a budget decrease of 5% over this year's budget. Um, and actually, it's a pretty significant decrease that we received. Um, that decrease is the actual number we received as part of the budget process from the ACTI. So that's where that decrease of 24,495 comes in. Okay. So the total expenditure from, these, from March till now is a decrease, which is obviously a great thing, of $237,978. Any questions related to those um, expenditure budget changes the only other uh, topic that we talked about last month was the T-Mobile hotspots. And so we did meet with our representative, Mr. Uh, Corb and I, and we're navigating through uh, some changes that previously weren't available for how we leverage those, the cost. And um, now we can shut some off when they're not in use. And so over the, over the summer months, we don't have to pay for the monthly bill. And previously we were having to pay um, over that time. So they've changed their program. So our hope is that during May, we'll be able to have some updated numbers uh, for Justin to update the budget regarding hotspots.
any questions related to that information? Okay. So, um, along with the expenditure changes, obviously we, we have some revenue changes as well. So what I've done is the two pieces of the governor's budget that everything we're hearing from from associations that we are enrolled with and take good information from is that the 200 million uh, is very solid and you should plan on receiving that dollar, okay? So the 200 million of basic debt subsidy, that's the dollar amount increase, the 148,161. That's what it equates to the Union Springs. So I've adjusted that in the budget. And then the $50 million increase with the proposed and special ed subsidy, um, we feel very certain that we should be getting that. And that's an increase of 35,050, okay? So the initial budget was up to this point was based on exact figures that we are receiving currently, 23.4. So this addition is what we are hearing and what we feel very confident that we will be getting, okay? Um, now, the big question is, will we get anything in addition? Um, that's the crystal ball um, that we don't know. So that's why I don't like putting anything in that we don't have a high level of confidence because it could backfire on us and get slammed in. We rely on it. It's not good practice to do that. So at this point, I have not included anything outside that was in the governor's proposal because there's a lot of talk that we're not getting anything above what these three figures are. Okay. Um, so along the downside on the revenue side, when you have a reduction in salary, which you just saw from professional and support staff, you also have a reduction in your uh, social security and retirement revenue because they're tied to each other. Okay. So that's all that is. So the offset of the money that we would get from the retirement uh, social security is that 22,480 increase. Um, the autistic support funding, this is what Dr. Hotchkiss had spoken about to the board earlier, uh, previous months related to the donor that we have secured and this money's already been accepted. Um, so that's related to the 105,000 towards autistic support. Um, so the total revenue change uh, is an increase of $266,539. Any questions related to anything in the revenue that anyone has? Justin, I have a question. Is the autistic support funding, is that something that will happen every year? Or is it, since it was a donor, is it a one-year thing? So at this point, our understanding is that the donor is planning on it being every single year. Um, but again, that's not something we Obviously, as we're hopeful for, we feel fairly confident. So, as I prepare the 25 26 budget, I'll know more at that time. But the hope is, and the thought is that yes, that 105 would be every year going forward. Awesome. Thank you. So, overall, between the changes in the expenditures and the revenue, it's a positive direction, as I call it, um, of $504,517, okay, from March to April. Okay, everybody understand that? Okay. So, um, this slide is one that you've seen since January, and you'll see through June, because as I've said numerous times, I view my job as providing you as much information as you need to make the decision that you have to uh, related. So as you recall, this is from a zero tax increase, which is the first column on the left-hand side. Then you see four different other options, 1.8%, 3.6, 5.4, and then 7.2. Remember your 7.2 is the actual index, okay? 
So the deficit now stands currently at a range of, at the Act 1 index, your deficit is $382,108. And to a zero tax increase, that deficit increases to $1,319,657. Okay. Any questions related to that slide? And that that reflects, as you can see there, the five hundred four thousand five hundred seventeen dollar adjustment that I just went through. What that is. Okay. All right. So this slide, like I shared, um, you've seen this since January, and I think it's very important. Um, as you get closer to the decision you need to make, um, this provides you with the additional dollars generated by each option, okay? Same uh, percentage increases that I showed in the previous slide, but the dollars associated with it, then with the millage rate increases, and then with the annual revenue loss on any option that you choose, okay? And then the bottom there, that is at the Act 1 index. That's the annual, that's the monthly tax increase at the Act 1 index. That's what they, it's at every one of those different options. So obviously at 0%, you have zero tax increase. 1.8 ranges from $3.96 to $2.88. So the last remaining slides showed you the effects of the fund balance and then um, based on what option you may be choosing. And again, that's not something we need to discuss now, but again, it's information that you need to have as you make your decision. So this slide here highlights, uh, again, this is in the Act 1 index. So the two items that have changed um, are the estimated fund balance that is added. We're still adding money to the 23.4. It's just less money based on the estimate change we had that I shared a couple slides back. So now we're only adding 40,366. So that gives you a new number there, 5.857. So the estimated end of this current fiscal year and now the new um, amount that we would need to use for the Act 1 index, if you went that way, the ending balance would be 5 million four seven five five. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions related there? Okay. So <clears throat> looking at your three-year projections, okay? So this is again at the Act 1 index. Um, as you can see, that beginning of the year in 25 26, that 5475 500, that's pulled right from the previous slide. Okay, so estimates are showing that the deficit next year are roughly 1.3 million. And as you can see, your ending fund balance through the next two years, you're good. And then the third year, there's one, a negative one and a half million dollars. Okay. And that's at the Act 1 index if you went that route this year. This is just a comparison of where you were last year, last month so in March. So as you can see, with the reductions and the budget and the change of the estimate, this is what it was in March. This is what it is now. Okay. So it went from 4.9 beginning fund balance to 5.2. Okay. Now you can see what the effects of the change that have been made. Okay. So now what I've done is each of those options that I've provided you in the last couple slides. So it goes to 5.4 to 3.8, to 3.6 to 1.8 to 0%. Okay. So this is a 5.4% increase. Obviously, the beginning balance. Of the fund balance changes because it's less of a tax increase. 
and also the budget shortfall changes, so it increases. Okay, so the first two years are still solid, and that third year, you have greater deficit. Okay. Then the 3.6, again, use the same concept. The beginning balance of the fund balance is reduced. The budget shortfall increases. You have just enough to cover the first two years, and then the last year, you get a higher negative balance. Then you're going to the 1.8. Again, lower beginning fund balance, a higher negative than year one. There's not enough money to cover two years of the budget, and then unfortunately, it obviously is higher. Okay. At zero, Nothing we can get worse as far as projections are concerned. Okay, so as you can see from zero, we go from 4.4 million beginning balance. If we fall at the Act One index, the beginning balance was 5.3. So it's that one million dollar figure that you saw from the follow up the slide. And it shows you that's the revenue lost, if you will, to choose the zero percent compared to the 7.2. Okay, so that's how these all play a part. So obviously the decision you make for this year's fund balance will have direct effect on every year moving forward. Okay. So again, I just wanna, I mean, the new board members may not be aware of this and it's probably a good refresher for me to introduce it to the more veteran board members, if you will. Um, but PA school code allows for a reduction in the millage rate from the preliminary budget to the final budget, but not an increase. Okay. So really all you're doing is starting the process, starting the budget process in May. Okay. What you decide in May has no effect at all on the overall millage rate that you ultimately decide. The only thing is, if you do not approve the act, if you do not approve the preliminary budget at the Act One index, then you cannot go higher. So if you approve it at the midpoint, you can't go up to five point. Well, you can't go up to the, the higher two options. You understand what I'm saying? Um, but if you approve the preliminary budget at the Act One index, and you still want a zero percent tax increase. That can still happen in June. There's no harm in doing that in May. Okay. Everybody understand the process. Okay. Because, like I say here in the second bullet, the millage rate is not final for the 24 25 school year until the adoption of the final budget in June. Okay. This semantics the budget must sit for 30 days. That's why there's 30 days between the May meeting and the June meeting. Okay. Um, and then the final thing that I have that I need direction on is how does the board want me to bring the preliminary budget for approvals in May? It, Justin, as far as how many options? Uh, well, I guess if, if that's the direction that the board wants to go, I mean, because again, like I said, we're not, there's nothing final when you talk about the preliminary budget. I guess what it comes down to is what is the board comfortable with as far as starting the budget process, as far as timing is concerned. Again, I will emphasize, you cannot go up, you can only come down from millage increase. Well, I'll let some of the other board members speak. Let them talk right now. I think what he's looking for is what option do we want on for May to vote on. First slide back. <clears throat> Can you put the first one back on that shows the the pack one is that? No, no, like the first one that shows the different colored options. That one? That's what you're asking. If you want more options, right? Which, I, which option do we want for May to vote on? Oh, I thought you were asking. I wanted more options. Yeah. 
we could do that from May to June. Because then that, what your decision is in June, obviously has a lot more ramifications than the decision you're making in May. Typically in years past, we just voted on the act one in May, and then we figured out exactly what we wanted by June. Because like he said, we can't go up, but we can go down. Um, I'm not really um, liking to go to the Act 1 index, even in May. So at the, at the highest rate I would go in May would be 5.4. I don't like that Act 1 index. It's way too high. high. Other districts are lower. We happen to be high. I know other districts are lower, and I know that's not under your control, but I cannot go 7.2. I would actually think 3.6, somewhere in the middle, middle range. We still have to fund our schools, but we can still do that. Just to vote for the ceiling. Yeah, we can figure that out. For the ceiling, okay. yeah. yeah. Not, it's just really definitely not me in June. Right. Definitely not the seven point seven. Can't go up. Right. But the people are gonna read that it's seven point two. They do not understand that I've been in this business a long time. I will not go seven point two in May. And then oh yeah, we're only gonna go three point six. No, I'm not going any higher than the five point two. I'm not gonna have that out there at 7.2 for a whole month. So we decide what we want. Same <clears throat> next, between then and now, they already changed now. I've been it is everybody comfortable going to what Ruth is saying, option B, 5.4? That's the highest I will go in that. I agree with that. I agree as well. Is that good with everyone? Prepare the preliminary budget at 5.4 is what uh, we're hearing. Okay, and just reiterate that once you lock that in, you cannot go above it if something happens. Correct. Correct. Okay. Just make sure everybody understands that. Thank you. You just need to stop sharing your screen. There you go. There we go. Okay. Next um, agenda item was the board policy review. And so last month, we had a number of policies that were a couple of new ones that were a result of some legislation and then um, some revisions. So policies 137.1, 137.2, 137.3 were new and uh, as a result of changes in legislation. And then policy 109, 137, and 249 were existing policies with revision. So during this past uh, process, we have not received any uh, written feedback regarding uh, regarding the policies, um, but wanted to certainly um, open up for the board to discuss based on your 30 days. Are there any? Um, so the way it works is I'll just pull up this policy. So there's a policy system with PSBA. So I actually copy, paste, into the system and so i work really hard to make sure we capture everything and all the changes the formattings correctly and so that's what you see here and so i included uh for each of those 
um, as you see them, that tomorrow would be the second reading and including uh, tomorrow's date. So that's the changes that you that you see. Well, the, I mean, you certainly can. There, there are no changes from last month. And so everything was exactly the same from last month for every one of those policies. Um, we do, I'm we, personally good with them. We went through and we outlined and we remember we had the track changes for each of those policies. So I just captured all of that. Based, so I'm, I'm good with them. Based on some of the minor changes that were suggested by Sock and Leader, the ones you go through and just make some minor revisions to 109. Okay. So what we're hearing, if you didn't hear, uh, based on some feedback from Stock and Leader, we want to take a look at minor revisions to 109. So I'm going to do my best to capture this, but go ahead. Under definitions, resource materials, we can just delete, uh, present it to students. Okay. I'm just making a note and then I will make, I will update that. Thank you. Yep. And there's a couple more. Um, under borderline resource materials, I'd like to add in for the purpose of this policy. Are you talking in the definition here on yes, the first page? The okay. For borderline resource materials, for the purposes of this policy are those materials that an administrator. So it's just okay. adding in that little preface. Okay. okay. Under delegation of responsibility, second paragraph, any borderline materials as defined in this policy, insert that. Okay. Under selection procedures for resource materials, first paragraph at the end, instead of saying below, established in this policy. Hmm. Not the next paragraph, but the part when you're ready. Okay. Um, not the next paragraph, but the next paragraph, Dan, when the superintendent slash designee, instead of saying borderline case, and say borderline resource material. Okay. Again, instead of saying guidelines below, again, established in this policy, it's just cleaning up the wording a little bit. And then All right. number 11. Um, on the back page, instead of saying the right, say significant discretion. That term is actually in the justice's um, verbiage in PICO versus Board of Education. So change right to what? Significant discretion. That's actual verbiage in PICO. Okay. And if we can cite number seven, PICO, versus Board of Education as a resource for that. Yeah. All right. Minor stuff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, policy 9-11. We are actually I would like to skip that. I thought okay. that uh, last night around eight or nine o'clock, I checked to see if it was available for the public to see on the agenda. It wasn't there. It may have been on ours, but the public couldn't see inside of the 24 hour window that we were going to be discussing discussing anything about policy 911. So as a discussion topic to be compliant with Sunshine, I would like to not so the, the discussion idle. 
policy 911 was listed as a discussion. I just didn't link the actual policy, but the policy is available on the website. So it was actually posted this morning that policy 911 was going to be discussed. But the difference here, you can see there's no hyperlink because I believe the direction I received was that we wanted to talk about it. And so I didn't link the actual policy itself, but the policy itself is available on the website. So it's really up to you. But it definitely was included this morning in the caucus agenda that was uploaded with the hot links. So the pub, it was public information. My, right, but my concern is that it wasn't listed as a discussion item at like eight o'clock or nine o'clock last night, which would be outside of the 24 hours. 24 hours is from the voting meeting, which is tomorrow. So we had to have anything on the agenda by 7 p.m. tonight. Okay, so you're saying we're still on. Very much so. Okay. We were at 30, almost 36 hours. Okay, well that's... So it's really up to you all. <clears throat> I just want to... But if, yeah, if... If you don't want to discuss it, we can just move right past it. If you do want to discuss, it sounds like uh, Dr. Hotch is saying we're we're legally okay to do it. But yes, if you just want to scratch and move on, we can do that also. I know. I, I, Sorry. I know. Start out that policy 109 has been around for years, but needed updated as all policies are to be updated every six years. We discussed this policy and proposed updates in just a few months. So it sounds amazing how a certain board member, Mr. Nelson, writes an article on getting for media page, which is against the other policy, policy 911, that includes invalid and totally false information. So either you're totally not paying attention during the meeting. Or um, we're just deliberately twisting shared information to create dissension between board members and the speaker. Does ridiculous things get twisted to use that for your guys' advantage and it happens repeatedly to cause an uprising among people? I'm surprised actually anyone looks at this anymore because of how many instances this happened, just like the teachers' agreement of totally twisted information. Um, on to the next topic of why policy 109 is needed. I'm not sure why any parent, teacher, or committee member thinks a, that uh, sexually explicit materials should not have age guidelines. Books with explicit sexual contact should not be content, should not be openly available to school students, especially not middle-aged school students who may not even understand the concept or have even gone through puberty yet. There's a huge difference in maturity level among a fifth grader to an eighth grader, same way as a ninth grader to an 18 year old senior. Um, this might not have come to light had certain previous teachers not had some inappropriate books or reading lists that they did not notify the parents. This happened to my daughter about five years ago with a history class that the book had nothing to do with history. Parents were not notified at all. Um, why weren't parents notified, and why is the sexually explicit book into a history class? Some of these questionable books include explicit step by step acts of child rape and sex based rape and molestation. These types of books should not be readily available to any parent, any child without parental consent of certain age groups. Also, it's easy to think about how this affects children who have who have been abused in the past. Every school has had a few students, and reunion is absolutely no exception. If you think they're not in this district, you're wrong. We have had students in this district who have been abused, molested, or raped. It absolutely has happened. Um, how do you think this happens, or how do you think it makes the children feel if they're in that class and one of these books is on their reading list? Do you think they're going to speak up and say why they don't want to read it? No. Because the children don't want to any, they don't want anybody to know what's happened to them in the past. They try to hide it. Um, I've had numerous patients over the years that this happened to, and if they're trying to just read it because they know they're supposed to, and they don't want to speak up because they don't want anybody to know what's happened to them, this can send them into a mental crisis. 
And it has happened. I've had it happen to some of my patients. If parents are okay with their children meeting these kinds of sexually explicit materials at the time, do them at home. They can bring them themselves. It just shouldn't be readily available in our library where a fifth grader can see it, something that shouldn't be only for the older kids. No one knows what other children have gone through. The notion that a child should be, able, should be made to feel that they need to read something that makes them very uncomfortable. That being said, um, we should discuss 9-11 because according to policy 9-11, board should have final approval for um, all basic procedures regarding the news media in the district. From past instances, I thought it was put out by previous board president that people can speak up on social media, but they have to clarify that they're speaking of their own opinions, not as a board member. Correct. That, that is absolutely correct. Because if, if, if you don't say that, then you are, it's presumed you're speaking on behalf of the board. And that's something that we did not talk about. Nothing was stated. Um, I agree that the article was, um, there were a couple lies in there. Absolutely. Um, completely misguided, gaslighting, disinformation. And I have, I will go into that a little bit further. Um, when we talk about the CIRA committee on the board committees, uh, actually further down after board committees, I will talk about that because there's there's a lot of concern about the CIRA committee. Um, most importantly, what it is what it is stated to be is not <laughs> what it's made out to be. Um, it's definitely a lot more collaborative, more inclusive, and it's um, not just three people making decisions. It's far more collaborative than how it was portrayed in the news article. But I could, I'll get into that a little bit later when we discuss the CR committee. But I, I agree, you know, the policy 9 11. Definitely. You've had this information multiple months. But if you want to put out false information, it's funny, you fact, they're all confusing. Don't act like you didn't get the information. And then you put out incorrect information of what that committee is. You've been there, you've been at the curriculum meeting. And why is not a valid reason of what that committee is? Instead of saying three board members. Really? You want, don't want to include that the administrators are in it? That the building principals are in it? And or that one of the committee members is a teacher who has been here for, what, 15 years? And there were also invited parents. Parents were going to be included. We just, we just yeah. talked about that. I look back for everybody else. We just talked about that at the very last meeting that you were at. When I physically gave you a copy of the bylaws, I physically gave you a copy that I printed out of the bylaws. Okay, you know that we were talking about parent advisors in the meeting on how to give the parents in the vo in the community a voice. So how would we be taking away parent choice if we're trying to give them a voice? at an open meeting discussing curriculum, which has never been before, to discuss curriculum like this. This is to provide transparency with the curriculum, which hopefully will build the trust in teachers and you know, the distrust that some parents may have in the teachers can stop or we can start rebuilding. It's the focus of the transparency when you're the one putting out false information. Who's being transparent? Not you. You're putting out, you're putting out lies. You're putting out bad information. If you would have put out the actual policy, there is the factual information, which you've had for months. But let's not put out just the facts. And the three committee people do not have, they're not going to have the full set. We have all two see. administrators, and we're going to invite parents, and then we're going to come to the whole board. Well, yeah. three people are not going to make a decision, like was stated in the Gettysburg Connection. Which I've had several emails about. And it's been discussed how many months in a row? How many months? I'll be going on four now. <laughs> and we are not taking away parents' rights. They can go out and buy any book they want their child to read. You can give out one of the very common materials in a public school. A parent can go buy it, so kids can bring it in and read it in study hall or resource, whatever they call it nowadays. 
because I'm old school, it was study hall, could be resource now. They can bring it in and read whatever they want. Hey, Matt, I have some excerpts. Do you want to read the excerpt from the script? Give it to Charlie and it's cool. Would you like to read that out loud? Yes, I would read it. You want to read it out loud? Yeah. Read the excerpt. No, if you can't read it out loud, it has no business being in the middle school library. Sure. Again, if you can't read it publicly, it shouldn't be in our library for everybody as a ninth grader all the way to a senior. No, read it. Go ahead. The idea that there's a painting that's in our high school, some materials that are in our high school, there's a little bit of translating going on here, but it's good. But the idea they're that not they're not amazing. They're not amazing. They should be the same as a senior. The no. fifth grader is the same maturity as an eighth grader. Common sense, Matt. Common sense. The idea is these materials are already in our school district. That's some point, some somebody's going to look at this on the stage. The idea that there's some value to that material. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 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 Yeah,
leading information out there. Um, the board looks like it's moving in a direction to update a revision to a policy that already existed. And just to put extra caution on explicit material content into the policy. That's what it's coming down to. So if you're all fine with that, we can move along on to the next topic. What's that? I'm sorry. The, the um, amendments and stuff, would you had collaboration among other school districts of how they were adapting their policy as well? That's correct. Yes. That, that's correct. That's correct. Right. You, Shannon. That's correct. Josh, everybody had a say in the development of this policy, which was also something I was going to get into. So I'll be repeating myself when I say what I have but to we, say. But... Uh, just to be clear, we didn't develop the policy. We were given that policy. We looked through, we researched other, other districts. Uh, but we collaborated on that. Yes. And I, I do think that we have had something we did a little bit. Um, the idea then, too, is uh, oftentimes at this board meeting or something, so I hear some version of a comment that says something along the lines of this is what the community wants or this is what the people are, are getting or saying. And I don't always think that it necessarily represents all of our community. And I think sometimes that just creates this misunderstanding and has, while some people think that the policy is one thing, it's going to be the policy to bring something else. So like you were saying, Dan, instead of debating which is the right one or who believes what, is that you can at least then understand that there are differences about what people think is happening and what's going on. And you have- There's have always a, going to be different. You have an opportunity to then show that how we can bridge gaps then to to have people that have different viewpoints on how to come together on new ideas. So the things that I've heard before, some of the problems that we wanted to fix is parents were, students were being exposed to material that the students weren't aware. And I feel like we fixed that to some degree by having uh, state our district wide syllabuses. And then the idea then too is then when you first present the policy, a lot of times too, you think you want to provide more clarification and more details about what sexually explicit material is and how to regulate. I think those are concepts that most people will agree on and are an idea then too that could heal that though. Then we can tell everyone that we are working to make sure that everyone clearly understands what makes sexually explicit material in our district and how we don't want that to be regulated. Okay. So the difference then to Correct. the concern then is if we do have a little bit of an overreach, which is where we start to disagree a little bit though too, but then my concern is if we take it too far and have some group of whatever group it is, second guessing teachers or administration to make a decision about what is and isn't appropriate, that's kind of the part then that provides division in our community and makes people unhappy. So even though you might not agree with it and don't let you don't under or don't what provides the vision is that you sit out there and put out the information thoughtfully about the committee versus include that the administrators are involved in this, the board or the, I'm sorry, building principals are involved in it. You don't list any of that. That's okay, three board, three board members. That's not a bridging it. That's created again. Yeah. They have the ultimate decision. That's not true. There's definitely That's a, there's definitely a fire first kind of thing. That would be only. Awesome. So. All right. By some of your voters, I, I, I the majority of the people in this district are in favor of the revised version of one. And, and I do think more no, that is kind of one of the things I talk about that too. Is, is I do know, I, 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 I guess I, I do know there are plenty of people then that do support it, and I understand that. But I don't think necessarily we always understand on this table, on this veranda, there's plenty of people who don't as well. And that's the idea that too, as school board members, we represent all of the stakeholders. So oftentimes we talk about the voters and we certainly do. We're, off, we're clearly the oldest and representative of them, but we're a board, we're not Congress. So we have to represent the staff, the administration, the, the community at large, the taxpayers that don't come to the meetings and the students then too. So you have to speak to all of those people, even the people you don't agree with and even the people that have a different idea. So that's what I was saying is there is an opportunity to still make an improvement. We've made an improvement to protect our students. We can define what materials we find inappropriate. And I think that can have broad support amongst everybody in the community, not, and then, yeah, no. so, we can this. so you talked about all the community and, you know, let me be crystal clear. It has been said to me that, you know, the five families I represent, okay. 
if there was only five families that I represent, I wouldn't be sitting here right now because I know I'm not afraid to speak up. I'm not afraid to fight for the people who put me in this seat. The other thing is you talk about the, uh, the community, okay, the community at large. Over the past two election cycles, our community has spoken loud and clear because the dynamics of this board have changed drastically. So our, our community has spoken loudly and clearly at the polls. If they didn't want us here, we wouldn't be here. And if there's a change because we're not happy, then so be it. But they also know that they can approach us in the community, that they can talk to us in the community, and we will do what they ask us to do. That is the difference. Before, we didn't feel like we had a choice. We didn't have a voice. We didn't feel like we were being heard. So they put us here over the course of the past two election cycles to change the dynamics so the people who are sitting here not only tonight, but are sitting in the community feel as though they're represented and their voices are heard. That's how the community at large spoke. Do you think that the, the fact that you felt unheard, do you feel that maybe you're doing that for another segment? No, not at all. Because the majority of this community, the majority of this community knows darn well they can talk to me. And I've had I've had conversations with people where we just have to agree and disagree and disagree without being disagreeable. When no one is going to agree on everything all the time. But you can disagree and be polite and be respectful. You're not going to make everybody happy, but at the same time, you can't force everyone to follow into this one line. That's, I mean, that's why there's guidelines. There are guidelines with everything. There are standards for everything. That's what this does. I, I, I'm sure. uh, hey, everyone. And I, I, I think again, we're just starting to beat a dead horse here. Um, we're just going back and forth. We're actually not getting anything accomplished um so i think we should just move it on and move on to the next agenda item the next agenda you, item yours you, uh, board committee. you're welcome the next agenda item is actually yours board committees uh well i have nothing to report uh, i think that uh miss goldhan is going to go into the sira committee update okay so at the last meeting of the sira committee uh, a couple weeks ago, it was uh, 21st, I believe it was. It was about three weeks ago. It's, it was the third Thursday of the month. It's, it is every month. Um, we had talked about state assessments um, and state standards, and there was a slideshow, and all that is uploaded on the uh, on the website under curriculum committee. If anybody wants to find it, you can go to the school board tab, go under members, and then you'll see curriculum committee. And there everyone can find the curriculum committee, the Sierra committee bylaws, um, and you can look for yourself. And everyone can go on the website and look for yourself to find policy 109, the proposed updates, and feel free to look for yourself and look for some facts. But what I had prepared earlier, um, some of it was already said, so excuse me if it's competitive, but these are some of the things that I prepared to discuss about um, CIRA committee, the article, and other things. It's it's addressed here. Um, but first, I would like I wanted to thank Dr. Hotchkiss, Dr. Myers, Josh Ford, Chad, and Ruth for your collaboration on Policy 109 and the Curriculum Committee over the past few months. Next, I would like to provide clarification about an article Mr. Nelson had published in a local paper. In Matt Nelson's article, he states, one, the CIRA committee will have the authority to remove any material they deem sexually explicit. This statement is a lie. Fact, the CIRA committee does not have the authority to remove anything as a subcommittee of the board. The CIRA committee only makes recommendations to the whole board, so all board members have a vote, which is clearly outlined in the CIRA committee bylaws. Only the board as a whole can enact anything recommended by the CIRA committee. Every member of the board will have an opportunity to give their thoughts about any recommendations before voting, just like we do with everything else we put on the agenda. Number two, and I have 12 of them, so. 
with no other guide, there's no other guidelines in the policy. The quote from the article is with no other guidelines in the policy. Fact, guidelines are clearly outlined in policy 109 with each library having its own set of guidelines. The policy guidelines are also clearly outlined in the CIRA committee bylaws. Number three, the three people on the CIRA committee will use their own judgment and discretion to decide what constitutes sexually explicit. Fact, the CIRA committee is currently made up of two administrators and three board members who make recommendations to the whole board to approve or not approve. At the most recent committee meeting on March 21st, we started talking about an application process to add parent advisors to the CIRA committee to give parents in the community a voice. Matt, you should know this since you've been to every curriculum committee since we started in June. And I personally gave you a physical copy of the CIRA committee bylaws. You sat in the, in the curriculum committee just a few weeks ago and reviewed the bylaws and you still wrote your article leaving out key facts. That's completely dishonest. The disinformation and gaslighting in your article unnecessarily upset several teachers, parents, and students. Number four, any parent that objects to any resource for any reason is allowed to exempt their student from those assignments. That statement is also a lie. Fact, policy 105.2 states exemptions are only based on religious beliefs. Number five, removes parent choice. Guidelines do not remove parents' choice. This is not a book ban. Our schools are underfunded with a limited amount of space for resources. Number six, no group of parents should decide what books other parents' children can read. Again, the CIRA committee is a subcommittee of the board and can only make recommendations to the whole board only when a recommendation can be approved or not approved. Also, the majority of this board is made up of a group of parents, including yourself, who make decisions for this district every month and more often if needed. Number seven, in the article March, uh, excuse me, in the article Matt mentioned age appropriate materials to use in the classroom to most effectively deliver approved curriculum. Every resource is not listed on several district syllabuses. There's textbooks that are listed but often teachers use other resources that they may need to use to drive their content to, to be use their creativity to get that point across to that student that is well within their right they are more than welcome to do that those resources aren't listed and there's nothing anywhere that says those resources need to be listed but a general idea would be helpful but that at this point is not happening and that's where we need to lead like dr myers had once said we need to give our, our teachers their creativity to use whatever resources they need to in the moment. But now we'll have guidelines as to what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, which has not been established before. <clears throat> Number eight, then a list of syllabuses are approved, age appropriate materials is shared with the parents. Again, this is not the case for every resource and not for every class. For example, one syllabus states there are no required textbooks for this course. Materials would be provided in Canvas and in the class. This class should have had a list of resources since it is not a tech-based class. No listing for resources was provided for this class. Tech-based classes, for example, CAD and other shop-based classes like it, are really the only exception for not listing required materials. Another class syllabus stated, um, the syllabus may be amended at any time without notice. Matt, you should have looked at the syllabus to verify what you stated. Does it look that way based on what you wrote in your article? Number nine. Book bans are government censorship. Again, this is not a book ban. Guidelines are not book bans. Policy 109 even clearly states a student may bring in a book from home. If a parent wants their child to read sexually explicit material, then they can purchase the book instead of the district paying with limited taxpayer funds. Number 10, again with three people on the CIRA committee, decide what resources and books students can access, not educational, professionals, not even parents, end quote. We have administration and a teacher with 19 years of experience on the committee, not to mention we are adding parents to the committee. Matt, at the curriculum committee meeting, I personally gave you a copy of the bylaws and you went over the bylaws with a friend at the meeting. 
You purposely left out key facts in your article to mislead the readers. That is the very definition of disinformation and gaslighting. Number 11, now they want to create a committee with only three people. Fact, again, the committee is made up of two administrators and three board members for a total of five committee members. Additionally, we are looking to expand even more by adding parent advisors for a total of eight people to the Sierra committee. Matt knew all these facts because he attended the last curriculum committee meeting and reviewed the Sierra committee bylaws before his article on April 4th. Number 12, and final, why does this school board continue to make complications? How are we complicating this issue when we are trying to improve our children's education with the collaboration of administration, board members, and parents as part of the Sierra committee? Matt's deliberate omission of leaving out key facts is gaslighting, disinformation, and lying to people in our community, which undermines the committee, other board members, and administration. I would like to add, that the term age appropriate kept getting thrown around. The term age appropriate was never anywhere in the district until the revised guidelines were put in the policy 109. But yet age appropriate is being, you vote against age appropriate guidelines, but then you use age appropriate guidelines as if it's something you're in favor of. So I'm confused, which is it? That's all I have. Okay, uh, last topic, ACTI. Unfortunately, Travis had a, a situation. He couldn't attend our last meeting, but at our last meeting, um, there was a presentation on the budget, which we talked about here. We're looking to approve, and for us, the uh, budget has um, decreased. We continue to... Um, work through the creation of the, and it's already been created, but uh, getting it operating, the um, uh, authority that will, uh, is the entity in which if ACTI wants to buy property, build a building, has the ability to do that. And so that has continued. Um, we also reported out that um, negotiations have started. Um, over the last 12 months, what's happened is the, the, teaching staff at ACTI were employees of the Gettysburg School District. And so they are coming off of Gettysburg School District. So a new collective bargaining agreement has to be in place. And so that first uh, meeting has taken place. And there's a subcommittee of uh, joint operating uh, board working through that through that process. And so that's active now. It's going to take a little bit of time, but that's um, what's happening with ACTI. We also um, emphasized uh, the importance there are some seats that aren't filled. And so um, we, the goal for ACTI is to make sure that districts are reaching out and making sure that the right students are completing the applications. We do know there's a waiting list for some programs, particularly Allied Health, which is the most popular. We've actually added a second section for Allied Health. Um, and so one of the charges with uh, superintendents is we're gonna go back and making sure our guidance office is making sure that the right students are getting the application and have the opportunity to join a program at ACTI because the goal is we want all the seats filled. Now, the other the nuance where a seat wouldn't be filled if students um, uh, begin the program as a junior. At times, we lose kids when they become a senior; they don't participate, and we can't fill that seat because they've taken year one, and so we just can't jump somebody to year two. And so we do have that. And so our goal is to ultimately retain. Uh, retain our students from year one to year two. So if you see an open seat, that's that's the reason. So we are going to uh, put a strong focus. And I shared um, that we are one of two schools that actually hosted ACTI in the middle school. And so we wanted to plant that seed with our students about the opportunities when they get older um, in high school. And so kids were here and they were some Bermudian students. And we thought it was pretty powerful activity. And so the goal is to replicate that across the county for other middle schools um, in the future. That's it for ACTI. Yep. So uh, I guess uh, Mr. Chubb from afar or uh, Mr. Mathna, you, um, one of you want to lead through the public comment. I'll let uh, Travis, if you're okay to 
do it since you're there and you have uh obviously your your phone or some kind of something for a five minute limit if you could do that i greatly appreciate it okay. if you can't i can do it from here it'd be kind of weird though that's fine i got it i got it no worries all right <laughs> excuse me i apologize i'm a resource um we'll open up the public comment um please state your name um your township and uh, try to limit to five minutes um, and come up to the podium and talk. Thank you, Travis. Good evening. My name is Dr. Ms. Anne Piro, and I am former Bloomington Center Education Institute. I'm not sure if you're going to be in the parents of the case of the I'd like to hear some of the the murmurs of the Lifestyle of the age range of 5 or 7, 2019 winner of the Stonewall Book Award, is a book about a gender non conforming child. According to the American Library Association, the ALA documented 1,269 demands to center library books and resources in 2022. The highest number of attempted book bans in ALA began to silent data and censorship in libraries more than 20 years ago. Censoring resources is a book. This is a story about a child in school who loves mermaids and who's a rat that's a friend of a murder to the I'd like to summarize the book. Um, school board members have to listen to the book. I would just read this. On the evening of the authority, Julian is reading a book. And begins to imagine himself in the water, turning into a mermaid. In the pictures, you can see her taking, like she's taking her shirt off and his shorts off, and he's throwing his head. Who is trying to hurt him to feather him, dressing himself as a mermaid? And he's not a picture. And as he's leaning in the mirror, he's proud of how he looks. When his grandmother finds him dressed like this, he is nervous. Uh oh, he answers. Come here, you love, you darling, she said. She hands Julian a set of beads to wear on his neck, and then takes him to the beach and the other mermaids, and they all come to her with As someone who is an expert in the area of reading, literature, and curriculum and instruction, this book would be a request for my school library. I wonder if anyone might consider this to be a very broad, gray, and purposely vague definition of order. The proposed changes to the resource material policy 109 creates a money gray and vague area for every teacher, administrator, media specialist, and parent in the state. The district already has an opt out policy for parents and parents. There are children who may need to be seen in literature in order to speak up. I was one of those people. I have to be questioned from the board. What clear and measurable components might deem a material order? Because the policy is on here. What clear and measurable components will the zero committee use to evaluate any material that falls in the quote order criteria? What clear and measurable components will the board create in application for choosing the parents admitted to the love of the plot and I love plot? What training will the members of the committee have in order to become experts in getting educational material for any of the Bermuda first students? Will there be an expectation that everyone actually read the material in the stuff? Or will the process only focus on internet inquiries and scare tactics? Without the entity to be friendly, this policy and the Bureau Committee are open to big interpretations without clarity or purpose. Does gender not conforming fall under your sexual issues? They don't for me. Jen Wilson said at the last topic meeting of the walkback that books already in circulation in the district would not be retroactive to the new policies. Well, that won't happen. A few years ago, a list of books were given on high school faculty to be removed from their classrooms without any clear or measurable reasons that that why. These books were on a seemingly random list. Including T by Lori Paul Anderson, which has appeared in the 12th grade ELA curriculum from a piece 2005, and The Curious Indian of the Dog and Nighttime by Mark Hayden. 
Teachers use clear and measurable components every day to accept everything in their classrooms. These rubrics are essential to making sure that the teachers clearly explain expectations and objectively measure their academic success. If students that randomly receive numbers or letters from the training, both parents and students would not know what the expectations are. And in all honesty, you as parents, as would I, would be upset because the grade would be more vague and older. Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, don't join the book learners. Don't think you're going to instill fault by computing ethics that they have already rejected. Don't be afraid to go to your library and read every book. If this provision passes, there is still a lack of clear and mental components. Time's up. Without clear and measurable components, this policy review and its committee attempts to conceal the evidence of anything that can be considered. It completely takes away the expertise, trust, and education of the teachers, media specialists, and administrators in this, this district of life. And as you know, they are leaving this district in droves. It takes away the choice of individual parents to make decisions on the books, and information available to all students who attend the Bohemian Spring School District. It shows a fear for ideas and discussions and differences that don't exist with the district. This policy review is not the short way to ban books, but to let you may not like without taking into account all of our differences and all of our differences. Of anyone who urged to be different or special? Uh, my name is Lori Snyder, and I have two sons, one who graduated and another who graduated from this year. I want to begin by saying they have both had wonderful teachers in their years here at the meeting. Teachers who inspired them, challenged them, and taught them valuable skills. They maintained professionalism, held standards to which they aspired, and we are grateful for them. With that said, no teacher is above the praise. The notion that their professional training somehow excludes them from accountability and guidance in this matter. The majority in our community elected our school board for both transparency and parental representation. And that's exactly what they are doing. And that's, um, I listened to the board meeting Concerning this policy, and it angers me that in the last ditch attempt to prevent the policy from moving forward, the lone board member who is against it decides to cover the issues on his fellow board members to get his way. An op ed devoid of pertinent information and filled with hyperbolic language to incite people. And there are teachers waiting in line with the students about the policy, scaring them into believing things that are not true. Yet the onus is on us to trust them, despite behavior that is proven untrustworthy. I, along with many parents, welcome the other policy. A lot has changed in the last nearly 20 years since its inception, the most significant of which is the ideological factor of our institution, like the Department of Education and the National Education Association. Whose Twitter feed reads like activist wishes of diversity, equity, inclusion, gender theory, and social emotional learning, all of which are designed to make useful idiots and activists of students, like the time you see on college campuses. These institutions inform our teachers, those workshops, and create narratives that removed Dr. Seuss from Read Across America while championing books like Gender Queer and Fulman. 
The irony of this is not lost on him, considering Dr. Seuss, otherwise known as Theodore Isis, books contain top button topics of human rights and environmental issues. Of the millions of books available to students, it's beyond me why it's considered essential for them to have access to those containing sexually explicit material. Many of us will clearly manage to get through our education successfully without it. And the notion that this is somehow banning books or removing toys is intellectually dishonest. All parents have toys. In the same way that they can choose to feed their family to steady diet of hot dog and milk, but they cannot choose it for parents. Nor can they subject our children to hard films or allow them to drink alcohol if they decide it is okay for their kids to eat. No book has an inherent right to expose minors to explicit sex acts, verbally, visually, or physically. There are federal laws against it. I would have been mortified if my teacher had recommended Percy being a law class for an assignment. Then followed it up with probing personal questions based on the content. I would have questioned his motives because as adults, we're supposed to guide our kids into making positive choices. And that book was about one bad choice after another and filled with graphic content on drugs and sex. And what did this book have to do with CHS history? A course, a course costing families over $400 to take to learn about history. Clearly, not all teachers make good parenting judgments. No books are banned, and parents can choose. There are more choices than ever. Simply go on Amazon and pick anything from him with the hard book, or maybe you go to the library, public, and check them out for yourself for free. Your child is not surprised at anything you want them to see. As a parent, telling us to take a back seat because a teacher has a professional training in this school comes across as entitled and condescending. How can we be assured that all teachers make choices that are in the best interest of students? Because not all districts, which many of us were witness to during COVID, they aligned with they aligned the English and the Department of Education to advocate the lockdown to match, the damage of which may follow some for years to come. Those institutions were informed by the experts in their field, and people ceded their rights to them, and they were harmed because of it. And that is exactly what you are asking me to do. Our school has the lowest test scores in all of Adams and York County, but somehow we have the highest graduation rate. And some teachers are up in arms because we wanted there to be curriculum oversight. We are failing our students, and you're asking us to do more because you know that. It certainly doesn't appear that way. I really, there are great teachers out there who want to focus on academic excellence and set standards, who leave their ideologies out of the classrooms and push our students to thrive, teaching them how to think, not what to think. And our sons can have the benefit of having them. To them, I want to say thank you for caring enough to have our students to give them the tools that they need to succeed. We need more role models right here because it's not, it's what our kids deserve. They will be better for it, and so will our communities. And no amount of sexually explicit books will have that impact. They are not essential to their education or to helping them become better people. But by all means, Let's continue to justify keeping them in our schools. In closing, I do not need a teaching degree to weigh in on important issues impacting our kids. I am a mom, and I have taught our students so many valuable lessons and skills throughout their lives, and I know them better than any teacher. I have invested countless hours and years into raising them from their birth to adult. And no one gets to undermine the importance in their lives by imposing their values on them. My degree is in raising them to be the best humans they can be. And as parents, we get to decide what that looks like for them. And as adults, they will decide what that looks like for themselves. That is not your job. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Can I just ask a quick question? Who was the person who yielded their, yielded their time? Oh, thank you. Uh, 
Which policy were you talking about? Nine eleven. Policy nine eleven. It was number twelve and number discussion eleven. I feel like it was good. No consequences were not discussed. That um, typically this isn't a back and forth. Um, the, the, the board meetings are meant. I think that's something that the board president and the board would need to discuss. Uh, the solicitor is not here to give us guidance on that. So that's right. something with this just. Right. Yeah, she'll be here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've been attending these meetings and it's, it's uh, what I've seen in the taking notes and things. Um, 
I, I haven't seen support for the plan to do obviously I think his uh mind is uh the sentiment that everything he sees and hears leading up to that in the town building. Um and so many things have been said that I have written down, but um one of the things that uh, we talk about is the guidelines, and I've been to the meetings where I guess it was said that you work for foreign effort or representative, and you brought up 18 PA code section 5903, uh, which is kind of funny, it's under crimes and offenses. I'm just going to read this real quick. It says, uh, no person knowing the obscene character of the materials or performances involved shall display or cause a commitment or display of any explicit sexual material defined in subsection C, which says, any picture, photograph, drawing, sculpture, motion picture, film, video, any similar visual representation, or image of the person, a person, or a portion of the human body which depicts nude sexual content, or satanistic abuse, and which is harmful to minors. Any book, pamphlet, magazine, printed matter, however reproduced, or sound recording which contains any matter of English or paragraph one, or explicit and detailed verbal descriptions and narrative accounts of sexual excitement, sexual conduct, or satanistic abuse, and which taken as a whole is harmful to minors, which in Pennsylvania, a minor is under the age of 18. There's only three other states, and that's 19 and 21, so it goes up. So that's criminal. Um, and it says that the definition here of pedophilia is sexual perversion in which children are performed are the preferred sexual object. I have to say that and, and a pedophile is one affected with pedophilia. I'd say the Spurgeon's on that, that concept. And and without saying too much more about it, these administrators that are very uh, that Keep referring to every single meeting I come to. It's all about education and professional, this and that, this and that. Well, these educational professionals fell asleep at the job and they failed this system. And I think, along with what was said earlier, these people need to be investigated. Thank you very much. Anybody else for public comment? We do have, I know we do have ones that couldn't make it, three that didn't make it, that wanted to, uh, gave us their thoughts that they wanted uh, spoken public comment. So Jen's gonna read, read that for us. My name is Tyler Weidler. I am a taxpayer in the district with children and alumni from Bermudian as well. Above that, I believe that God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit himself came about the children in this district, and that everything that happens here is accountable to him. So it is with the, the unction of the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that I implore you to keep up the good work of our time. The board is doing a fantastic job with Policy 109 and ought to be thanked and congratulated for it. It is the right thing to do. It will be a blessing for all families in the district and will be a good starting point for fixing certain problems. We elected most of this board in the past two election cycles, and I am pleased with the direction you are taking. Keep it up. The CIRA Committee in Policy 109 addresses important issues of our time, and you are wise to implement them. I have students in my church youth group whose parents ask me repeatedly over multiple years what they can do about the destructive materials in their children's access to school without their knowledge. This is a major problem about which I have stated my concerns in the past. Each of these families have pulled their students from Bermudian Springs because their concerns were not met. In fact, not only were they not met, they worsened. Many have dozens of students in our church who have left Bermudian as a district, excuse me, as a direct result of the low standard curricula and degenerate reading materials. These families have all stated a sense of relief and an improvement in attitudes, behavior, and educational outcomes as a result. This has been true not only of Bermudian Springs, but across the American education system as a whole. For the past several decades, we have all heard reports about failing test scores, failing literacy rates, 
and American students falling behind other countries. Students know more vocabulary words for sexual identity and anxiety disorders than they know about basic God-fearing virtues that build civilizations. Our young people should be the most energetic and ambitious generation. But what do we see far too often is anxiety, depression, sexual disordering, social media addiction, video games, and other vices that rob them of their God-given joy and potential. This is what comes when parents outsource their children's education to a system that ignores them and does not fear God. Parents no longer willing to trust nor participate in this failing system, and I am grateful to see this board taking these matters seriously. The CIRA Committee and Policy 109 standards will help resolve these problems. Thank you for loving your neighbors in this way. I am hopeful that it will pass and live up to its promise. With that in mind, when you form the CIRA Committee, you have a chance to not only stop this decline, but to reverse it. The goal should be to raise the standards of the curriculum and reading materials. It is not just a matter of removing the low brow, low standard toxic materials. That is starting. That is the starting point, of course, but it is not the ending point. Find books that make better students, that teach virtue and encourage and use vocabulary words that nobody uses anymore, like temperance, sacrifice, modesty, and other principles that would build strong communities under God. Find books that remind young people that their lives have eternal purpose and value, that they are not just depressing accidents full of anxiety. Find books that will wake them up every day, knowing they were made for a reason, under God, that they are his image, that they matter, and that they were created for God's works in this world by Christ Jesus himself. Our culture and community are blessed by God with a heritage of virtue, hard work, and great joy. Pass this grace, great inheritance forward to the next generation and watch our young people grow into great forces of righteousness and strength. Set them free from the low expectations of our world and challenge them forward into greater virtue and their full God-given potential. Raise the standards and give parents more oversight, more representation, and more involvement in what their children do and you will have better students and better neighborhoods. I am excited to see this board in action, standing for what is right, blessing families, and doing the important work we elected you to do and which Christ himself watches. God bless you. Do not grow tired of doing this important work of our time. Yeah, go, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I, I flipped mine around so that people can pick it up. Yeah. All right. Dr. Grace is not just supporting some items in that. <laughs> but the point is, it doesn't matter as far as educational level, training level. Each one of these parents you see here should be able to go to school. And they're not in these things along the way. They're not going to be in these things. Not going to be in these things. Let's see what we're trying to do. And oftentimes, when you want to consent, you know, but as students come to a public school, they should know unless they give their consent to suck a different program, pass their age, and give them another team. They don't have to worry if they're still coming to front of those kind of situations or what their own guidelines look like. Um, parents need to know that this explicit type of content isn't going to be uh, in these in the libraries, in the guides. It's easily accessible to anybody to let their consent to what they do. But those families want to take each other. Sexual things is inappropriate 
add these skills. When some families are one of the two jobs, you may know you can't be there every time to see. And that's where we have that curriculum that makes sure that this stuff isn't there without their knowledge. Um, I have how many years of, of training now that every two years, high end deaths, overdue abuse, child abuse, opioid abuse. These are 10 hours out of 60 hours at every uh, two years that I have to get training. Every two years, but I just went to eight more hours to have to do the MC training. All about these kind of abuses all the time. Why? Because every year there's doctors that fall out of them. They get arrested, they get thrown in jail, because they don't meet those guidelines. And that's why we have that training. So to say that every teacher is going to make the right decision because they have four or five, six years of education, we can't see. They have to be guidelines. And every year I see people in my profession, lawyers in the appropriate accountants, unfortunately, that small percentage is going to fall out of those guidelines. And that's where we have to protect the kids. Once an incident, second case an incident occurs, it's too late. You cannot do that. All right, there's actually a life story I remember. I, my first year in this college, now we've all been a number of years, but our profession, in the profession, there was a part of the book, the Air Force, all of us. I don't know if there's anybody that was that too. But he said in this book that there was a point in that about three. And he gave the pages, he said, any student is not comfortable with this. These are the pages, you're not responsible, you don't have to read it, and you don't have to take part of the discussion. I remember there was a girl sitting next to me who got out, she was emotional, had a discussion, and it was a case of something she wasn't comfortable with. Never got into detail, but because that teacher gave her that instant, even her college imagine, every time a situation that could maybe turned out really bad. And I think Mary made a really good point. Mary deals with the athletes. And I also have a certain percentage not as high, but there are kids who emotionally, physically, or sexually abused already. And it's called a trigger incident. When you read something or get exposed to something, that incident, even though it's been buried, it's never dealt with appropriately by a trained profession. I'm not talking somebody who would get training things as a teacher. I'm talking about years and years of therapy. If that situation wasn't talked to, that layer of thing that was buried for years, it'll immediately come to the surface. And there's exact trauma that occurred in the incident. And that's the thing we need to avoid as a school. That brings up lawsuits, it brings up trauma. And the thing is, if something like that comes up to you with a kid that was already affected by that, is that teacher going to be willing to counsel and care for that kid for the next time it is? Or is that kid going to be damaged? And that's the question I have. That's why it's important to say the school is taking responsibility if you're not getting this bad curriculum and the sexual abuse stuff out of the way. That's my thing. You have to take a big risk. I'll get that. What's your name? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a voice I'm a voice down here since day eight. I've been soccer here in the media for 10 years. I've been treating pediatric kids for 27 years. All right. Every two years, I still move that tree. And why is it? Because they call it grooming. What these adults do is they give a little bit of information, maybe a little touching, a little activity, but giving them sexual information and sometimes and then sharing that with them, that's a part of grooming. And that's in the training that's a group of us or another student for that team. Um, and, and I guess that's the main thing. Just be careful what we're asking. And when I read over this curriculum, it really is part of three board members. There's parents involved. It's part of the school board member. I'm an understanding assistant superintendent would be part of this process. I didn't understand why I checked out and see that this seems so simple and go. And again, this is only, it has to be passed by the committee, looked at it, and then it's reviewed and brought to the board. All right. When I used to go to the library, I think for police to start burning books. That's what the mess happened. All right. I remember we did that in the 80s. All right. It's just a process. And one, it protects us with nationwide, and then parents know that they're working two jobs, and they can go and look at Johnny and Jenny's every book that they're reading. They know that they're being protected, and it's not beyond their values. Thank you.
Anybody else want to come up to the podium? I think we have two more. We have two more to send in. Yes. All right. Go ahead. All right. One from Melanie Tate, Huntington Township. I am a taxpayer living in the Bermudian Springs School District, and I want to speak out in support of the revision of Policy 109. It is about time that we remove sexually explicit books and materials from our school libraries. Graphic book Graphic books have no place in our schools. Our schools should be a place for children to learn, not be exposed to highly inappropriate and sexually explicit graphic materials. If reading the content of any material in front of my mother would make me uncomfortable, then it doesn't belong in the library. The agenda of the left should not take preference over training up children in the way that they should go. I would ask what processes are in place to review new materials added to the library. In addition, we need to be sure our school children are not able to get into pornographic websites using school iPads or laptops. If our school's computers and tablets point students to databases such as EBSCO, E-B-S-C-O, or GAL, G-A-L-E, for homework help, they are in danger of being exposed to pornography being exposed to graphic material. These databases operate outside the filters that schools are legally obligated to install. Thank you for being willing to do what is right in revising policy 109. Last one. It's from Melissa Wagner, Reading Township. I am writing this email to address a letter that I came upon in the Gettysburg Connections Facebook page. This letter was written on social media by a school board member addressing his frustration with a policy. As a teacher, parent, coach, and former substitute at the district, I may not be able to come to many school board meetings. I do follow and keep up with what is going on in the district. I do not feel this is appropriate behavior for a school board member to go on social media and address these three members of this committee who states is attempting to ban books. I do not feel that understanding what resources teachers are using or what books are in the library that my child has access to is banning books. As parents, we trust that the school board is watching over everyone in the district to make sure that our children are are being educated and protected during the school day. This includes what the children read or could possibly read. While everyone in a school may have different views, politically or religiously, it is the school board's job to protect and watch over the whole. The community has voted for the school board members to look out for our best interests of our, of our students and district. We need to trust that looking over a policy and adding some guidelines is not banning books, but make sure that all content is appropriate, appropriate for all students. Let's please be respectful, listen, and come to an agreement that is best for everyone involved. Thank you. Anybody else uh, for public comment? Going once, going twice. We're good. Yep. Meetings adjourned. All right. And uh, meetings adjourned.